Kerrigan from Pinpoint Evangelism here with you today and have a new video for you that I'm going to title the 10 pitfalls of the open air preacher. Now I've been open air preacher for about seven years now and in that time which is a short period of time compared to uh, some open air preachers out there been preaching for 25, 30, even 40 years some of them. So it's a very short amount of time compared to some uh, but in this period of time, seven years or so, I, I've learned a lot, and I've seen things I don't like and things I do like, and uh, observed a lot of <clears throat> different open-air preachers preaching from different theological backgrounds, <clears throat> different lengths of time preaching, and I want to share with you uh, some pitfalls that I believe open-air preachers have and can fall into, and, uh, you know, I've even fallen into some of these myself, to my own shame, so... Um, please uh, listen to this video carefully, and if you're an open-air preacher or considering open-air preaching, consider these things. If you haven't fallen into these pitfalls yet, protect yourself from falling into these pitfalls. If you're involved with people who are involved in these, who are doing these things as open-air preacher, and you feel the influence to be involved in these things as well, then I would encourage you to depart from their company, from their fellowship. Uh, not, not saying that you think they're an unbeliever, but, you know, people you hang around will influence you. I know it's happened to me, so I don't want this to happen to you as well. So uh, these are the ten pitfalls of the open-air preach. Let's go through them one by one. Let's look at number one first. Staying in rebuke mode all the time. There were definitely times that the Old Testament prophets, uh, John the Baptist, Jesus, the Apostles, etc., were rebuking people. Uh, the Old Testament prophets were, were constantly rebuking rebellious Israel, but that wasn't all they did. Uh, John the Baptist was uh, rebuking the religious leaders of his day, and Herod, but that wasn't all he did. Uh, Jesus rebuked the religious leaders. He, he turned over tables in Temple Court at least two different times. Uh, he pronounced woes upon whole cities, but that wasn't all he did. Uh, Peter uh, rebuked very harshly Simon the sorcerer, but that wasn't all that he did. You know, uh, Paul rebuked harshly Elemis the sorcerer and even pronounced a curse of blindness upon him. But that wasn't all he did. You know, so when we're out in the open air preaching, we shouldn't be in rebuke mode all the time. We shouldn't be constantly dealing with sinners harshly in a hard way, rebuking them hard. Uh, there should be gentleness and kindness in our tone of voice and our bilingual um, regarding our preaching to the sinners. And in that way, we are more fully following the, the whole counsel of Scripture. Uh, yes, we can find Scriptures where these people rebuked people harshly, but it shouldn't be all we did. And in fact, I would assert to you that most of the time, they were not in rebuke mode, these people. The Old, Old Testament prophets, Jesus, John the Baptist, the apostles, they, weren't, they were rarely ever, in my opinion, in rebuke mode. But there is times when rebuke is, is, is merited. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, Preach the word in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Proverbs 27, 5 said, Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Revelation 3, 19. Jesus said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Ephesians 5, 11. Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So yes, there is a biblical mandate for reproving, reproving and rebuking, <clears throat> and rebuking if done with a loving heart towards the person you're rebuking is a loving thing to do. Um, but we shouldn't be in rebuke mode all the time. This is one thing I've had to check myself I, and, and my brother John, uh, my other, the other person who's a pinpoint of evangelism, regarding these issues. We need to check ourselves regarding these things. So that's, that's the first pitfall of the open-air preacher. And if you're involved in this, I would encourage you to search the scriptures to get a more balanced view on this issue, to see that Jesus, John the Baptist, the apostles, the Old Testament prophets weren't always involved in these things. Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet. Uh, but uh, there's been rare a time when I found a preacher who rebukes who has a weeping heart towards the sinner. So we seem to be real balanced in this issue. Realize there is a, a biblical mandate to rebuke at times, depending on the person you're talking to, and to rebuke even harshly in a hard way where they won't feel love from you when you're rebuking them. Uh, but it would be loving as long as you're doing it with a loving heart towards them and you're doing it for the glory of God. Let's look at number two. Not preaching the whole counsel of God and not having enough knowledge of the Bible or not having many verses memorized. So instead of actually memorizing 
the Bible and scriptures and knowing what the Bible says concerning issues. What I often see with open-air preachers is they're more of a parrot of an o other open-air preacher they've watched, or they'll use lots of cliches. And while cliches in themselves aren't sinful, and it's not sinful to say what you've heard other open-air preachers say, uh, the main thing should be the main thing, that's preaching the Bible. And uh, if you don't have Bible verses memorized, you need to start memorizing Bible verses. You should have verses memorized that you can preach in the open air. Uh, yes, you can get out and read the Bible as well, but I, I found it's more effective to actually just quote the verses. And to, to know uh, what, the, what the Bible says, so you can quote it to people, especially when you deal with professing Christians in the open air who are hypocrites. You can show them the truth by quoting the Bible to them. So, um, although there are times that cliches would be good to use, um, and there are times when you can, especially when you're first getting started out, that you can use things you've heard of the open air preachers say, God wants you to preach the Bible. Uh, so that's what you should be doing. He didn't say go into all the world and um, ask trivia questions to give people money for them. He said go into all the world and uh, say cliches, but go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that's what we should be doing. So, uh, we shouldn't be going into all the world and using comebacks to insult the sinners, but preaching the whole counsel of God. And that's the second part of this pitfall. It's not just not memorizing the word of God enough and just preaching cliches or being a parrot, but not preaching the whole counsel of God. And oftentimes what I see from open-air preachers, even ones who've been, there, been out for a long time, those who are up and coming as well, who are just getting out there, is that they're usually just preaching the bad news. But there's a reason to preach the bad news, and that's to finally get to the good news. You know, I preach the bad news to a sinner so I can bring him to the good news and give him hope and help in Jesus Christ, and not leave him hopeless and helpless in their sin, feeling the full weight of their sin upon themselves. So we must preach the good, the good news as well as the bad news, not just the good news, not just the bad news. And, and when I hear, you know, going back to this first part of this pitfall, I hear people who do have verses of the Bible memorized, a lot of times the only verses they have memorized are, their, are the bad news verses, or the verses that are, are kind of more shocking than others. They, they rarely ever have verses memorized about the cross, about, about God's mercy towards humankind, or about his love towards them. And I rarely ever hear an open-air preacher these days, uh, for one or even one or two minutes, talk about the grace of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness offered through Jesus Christ, or the cross, and what Christ did there. I rarely ever hear preaching on those issues. You know, I, I hear the good person test being preached, and then hearing the you know the old uh, formula of you broke the law, Jesus paid your fine. But that's about all I hear um, from people. So we need to preach the Bible. You need to understand the Bible for yourself, memorize it for yourself. You know, what I've done is I read through the Bible, I'll highlight verses that I think will be profitable to use in the open air, I'll highlight in a certain color, and that way when I'm going through, back again, I can make note cards if I want to from that certain color of highlighting that I've been reading and studying throughout the week, and to expand my verses that I have memorized regarding what I will preach in the open air. So, I would encourage you that if you're just preaching the bad news, or you're just preaching cliches, or you're just being a parrot of another preacher, you need to get in the Word of God for yourself, study it and memorize it, and preach the whole counsel of God in the open air. That's what you should be doing as an open air preacher. And which and the, the part we'll focus on the most when it comes to preaching the whole counsel of God, whether you focus on the good news or the bad news, sometimes it'll just be a balance of both, but there will be times where we'll focus on the good news over the bad news. If the sinners who are listening have broken hearts, they're humble, they're quiet, I'll focus more on the good news. If they are justifying their sin and glowing in their sin and uh, proud about their sin, then I'll give them the bad news. And the principle is very clear, law to the proud, grace to the humble, because the Bible says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So that's how we'll determine which side we'll focus on more than the other. But we must preach the whole counsel of God. Let's go on to the next pitfall of the open-air preacher. Pitfall number three is being hard-hearted towards a sinner slash forgetting where we have come from. You know, a lot of times I see in the open air, uh, you know, this might go along a little bit with point number one, staying in rebuke mode, is that people who are open-air preachers seem to forget where they have come from. Even those who believe in holiness, believe in living a godly life, uh, they seem to forget where, not only where they have come from, 
but what God's heart is towards a sinner. God has benevolent love towards all sinners. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for all sinners. Uh, he takes no delight in the death of the wicked. He wants all sinners to be saved. Um, Jesus says to turn the other cheek. Jesus says to pray for your enemies, to do good to them, um, to bless those who curse you. You know, not to punch them in the face or to push them or get in their face. Uh, the Bible says that it is God's to repay and His to avenge, not yours. So, uh, if you know, if if you don't think you're going to be able to control yourself in the open air, let's say a sinner comes to you and pushes you or spits at you or throws something at you or or wants to throw a punch at you. If you can't control yourself, if you don't think you're going to be able to control yourself to the point where you don't retaliate and punch back or push back, or maybe they're getting in your face and you're the first push in the front, first person to push, to the first pushing person to, uh, to punch. If you don't think you can control yourself, you shouldn't be out there preaching at all. At the least, you shouldn't be going to places like, you know, Mardi Gras, or a certain festival at the sexual festival, or a homosexual uh, pride parade, where you know you're going to run into these violent things and you won't be able to control yourself. You know, it blows my mind that open-air preachers, I'm seeing more and more videos of this, open-air preachers who who will go into the open air and they'll, they'll push sinners, they'll punch sinners, they'll retaliate against things they're doing to them, uh, you know, they'll get up in their face and get angry with them, and I don't think this is biblical at all. I mean, show me one example in the New Testament of Jesus or the Apostles uh, getting up in someone's face or punching them or, or uh, retaliating against them. Uh, there isn't one. Oh, wait, there, there is one. His name was Peter. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he cut off the servant's ear. And what did Jesus tell him to do? Put down the sword. You know, so the Bible makes it clear to love our enemies, pray for enemies, bless our enemies, do not curse them, do not return uh, bad for bad, but good for bad, uh, to allow God room to repay. It's his to avenge, not ours to avenge. You know, so if you don't think you can control yourself on the open air, to the point where you're getting a hard heart towards a sinner, a callous heart towards them, you don't have love or compassion for them, or to the point where you, you, you forget where you have come from, that you're not treating them like you would have wanted to be treated when you were a sinner hearing a gospel preacher, then you shouldn't be going out there in the first place. You're giving Jesus Christ and other open-air preachers a bad name, and it needs to stop. Um, and, you know, and like I said, part of the problem for most open-air preachers is they forget where they have come from. Uh, they forget that they were once wicked sinners. You know, even if they're living a holy life right now, uh, even if you're living a holy life right now, you shouldn't let your hatred for sin turn around and become your hatred for the sinners. Only God has the right to hate a sinner. He's the one that created him. He's always been holy, never has sinned, never will sin. We have sinned in the past. We haven't created anyone or anything. Uh, we have no right to hate anyone. And the Bible says that hatred is murder of the heart. And if you're a murderer, you don't have eternal life living in you. You know, so if you don't have a love for the sinner where you want their greatest good, you're loving your neighbor as yourself, of course, loving God through your heart, soul, mind, and strength first, then you shouldn't be going to the open air. You're giving open air preachers and Christians and Jesus Christ a bad name. So, and hatred for your heart and your heart for the sinner makes you just as bad as them. So if, if you're to the point where you're getting hard-hearted towards a sinner, or you're forgetting where you have come from, or you're getting violent with the sinner, then you need to stay home and get right with God. Uh, you, you need to stop going to open air for a while until you get right with God, and you get to the point where you can, you can have self-control, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit, and the open air, and love the sinner like you want, would want to be loved if you were still in their place. So that's the, that's the third pitfall of the open air preachers. So, so far, we've looked at three. We've looked at staying in rebuke mode all the time, uh, not preaching the whole counsel of God, or not having enough knowledge of the Bible, and not having enough mem uh, verses memorized. And number three, being hard-hearted towards a sinner, forgetting where you've come from, or getting violent with the sinner. And number four uh, is one that many aren't going to like. It's using words like whores, fags, and homos, etc. in the open air. Now, I've seen a rise in this lately, where newer open-air preachers are using such words in the open air. And these words are inflammatory, they're insulting, and they cause unnecessary offense to the hearers. 
the gospel message that sinners are going to hell and they deserve hell for their sins if they don't repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, forgiveness of sins, is offensive enough that we don't need to make, add, add any unnecessary offense to it. And, um, you know, I've only heard one good, I don't really think it's good, one good excuse uh, for using one of these words. That's the word whore. And many open-air preachers will say that it's, it's a biblical word. And of course, it is, it is found in the King James Bible, but it's not found in any other translation that I know of. Uh, but even if you are a King James only, a King James only preacher, I don't think that your justification for using this word is good enough. Uh, because you may use a word like, a, like whore, which is found in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, or in other scriptures in the, in the passages in the Bible. You don't, you don't use other words that the, that the King James Bible calls sinners. I re I've never heard a King James only person who justifies their use of the word whore on the open air upon it being in the King James Bible. I've never heard them use abusers of themselves of mankind to rebuke a homosexual. I've never, I've, maybe once or twice I've heard them use the word effeminate. But usually they use homosexuals and sodomites, which are found in the New King James Version. But in the New King James Version, you see fornicators there, not whores. So, and... So you're causing unnecessary offense. And the question I would have for you is this. What is your intention in using that word? If your intention in using that word is saying it's found in the Bible, then why aren't you using other words that are found in the King James Bible? You seem to be picking and choosing, if you ask me. Very inconsistent. And so you're causing unnecessary offense. Not only that, it's a, la it's a lack of good communication. Because the hearers who are hearing you call them the word whore are using that word. They are going to... Um, think you're accusing of being someone who's a prostitute who's getting paid for having sex because that's what the word whore means in our modern day sense a person a woman who's getting paid to have sex with men or other women but when you're rebuking someone and calling them whore that's not what you mean but it's what they take it as so it's a lack of good communication you're causing unnecessary offense and what I've seen when I preach to people who use this word is it causes problems the rest of the time we're there if we're at a college campus, for, the, for the, just for that day, it causes, they're bringing up the whole rest of the day. We can't even focus on the gospel, and that they're a sinner and even a sinner. They always bring up, oh, you called this person a whore the rest of the day. Is that really what you want to deal with the rest of the day? That you use this one word that you're holding on to for, for your dear life? Why not give it up and use a word that's not unnecessarily offensive, and that communicates more effectively, like the word fornicator? Or if you see a woman dressed in modesty, instead of calling, calling her a whore, call her an immodest woman. That's what 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10 calls her, an immodest woman who doesn't dress in modest apparel. In modest apparel. They're ungodly and they will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I don't think people can justify their use of the word whore upon this, this uh, reasoning that it's in the Bible. Because they don't use any other words that are found in the King James Bible to describe sinners. So they're being very picky and choosy. So my question for you is, are you using that word? Search your heart. Are you using that word just to be inflammatory? Just to be insulting? Just to get a rise out of the sinner? If you are, you need to repent. Your heart is not right towards a sinner or towards God. And that should not be our intention towards them at all. And you need to stop it. You're giving all of us a bad name. All of us open-air preachers. And uh, Pinpoint Evangelism, we've had the standard for about a couple of years now. Uh, well, we've had a standard for longer than that. I've only used that word once personally in the open air, and I probably shouldn't have even used it then. Uh, it was probably about three years or so ago. Uh, I was in Columbus, Ohio, and there was a woman walking around with just paint on. I don't think she had any clothes on at all, walking around the streets of Columbus, Ohio. And, uh, you know, it... It rose up righteous indignation in me, and I, I called her a whore. And, and literally speaking, she, she wasn't a whore. That was lack of communication on my part, because she was really worse than a whore. Most whores don't go around dressed like that, and with no clothes on. And, but she wasn't a whore in a sense where she was uh, getting paid for sex. But even in that sense, I probably shouldn't have used that word. I'm just simply telling you that there's no reason to cause unnecessary offense in the open air. And those of you who like to use this word so often, and, and I'm not saying it's a sin necessarily to use this word, but if you like using this word so often, you probably need to repent. You need to get right with God. And, and using the words homos and fags, fags isn't found in the Bible, so you can't justify it upon that. And homos is really a derogatory way of saying homosexual. And they take an unnecessary offense to it. Um, so I don't think there's any reason to use these kind of words. 
And at Pinpoint Evangelist, we've had the standard for about a couple years now. You can go to our website, click on the About Us at the top, and then click on our standards after that at the top. And you'll see some of the standards we've had for ourselves. And I think it's point number six that we don't, we don't use these words in the open air because we don't want to cause unnecessary offense. And we want to be blameless before God and before the world. We want to tap into not to people's emotions, which is what these words rise up, people's emotions. We want to tap into their will, their mind, their intellect. We want them to be saved. And tapping to their emotions is not going to get them saved. So that, that's point number four. Point number five. The idolatry of drawing a crowd. Uh, for some open-air preachers, getting a big crowd seems to be getting a big crowd seems to be the end in their open-air preaching. In other words, they think that if they get a big crowd, that equals success for them. And if they get a small crowd, that equals failure to them. Not so, friends. Not so. Um, where is this principle found in the Bible of getting a big crowd equals success and getting a small crowd? equals failure. If getting a big crowd equals success, then Joel Osteen is the biggest success in all the world. Well, we know that's not true as open-air preacher. He doesn't even preach repentance. He doesn't preach the whole counsel of God. He's a, he's a guru. He's a self-help guru. Not a Christian, not a pastor or a preacher. He's a self-help guru. And uh, But the Bible doesn't say go into all the world and get big crowds. Um, the whole point in getting a big crowd, if you do get a big crowd, is to preach the whole counsel of God to as many people as possible. You haven't been successful just because you get a big crowd, and you haven't failed just because you get a small crowd. You've been successful as an open-air preacher if you preach the whole counsel of God to sinners with a biblical heart of purity towards them and with a motive of wanting to glorify God. Let me say that again. You've been successful as an open-air preacher if you preach the whole counsel of God with a biblical heart of love towards a sinner and a motive of glory towards God, doing it for His glory. No matter how big or how small your crowd is, you've been successful as an open-air preacher if that is what you're doing, preaching the whole counsel of God with a heart of love towards a sinner and a heart of wanting to glorify God in everything you're doing. That should be your motive. So <clears throat> getting a big crowd is a means to an end, not the end in itself. If the end in getting a big crowd is to preach the whole counsel of God to them with a heart of love toward the sinner and wanting to glorify God, then it's okay. It's, it's okay to have a big crowd. But if the means you use in getting a big crowd are ungodly, then you might as well not have a crowd at all because you're sinning against God and you're doing it in front of more people than you should be. You shouldn't be sinning in front of anybody, period. You shouldn't be sinning uh, at all, period. Uh, but when you're sinning and you're drawing a crowd through ungodly means, then there's something wrong with that. Something wrong with you. Uh, and not only that, the means you use to draw a crowd is the means you're going to have to use to keep the crowd. If the means you use to draw a crowd is jokes and foolishness, you'll have to engage in jokes and foolishness the rest of the day. If the means you, you, you use to get a, a large crowd... Uh, was being unnecessarily offensive to people, then you have to be unnecessarily offensive to keep the crowd the rest of the day. But the means you use to get a crowd, whether it's big or small, is preaching the Bible. Then praise your Lord. You can preach the Bible the rest of the day, which is what you're supposed to be doing anyway. And you know, when I go into the open, open air, uh, whether it's on a college campus or uh, on the streets, I don't think to myself as I'm going out there and pray to God, oh, I hope I get a big crowd today. Oh, Lord, please help me to get a large crowd today. Um, I think to myself, Lord, help me to be balanced. Lord, help me to uh, rebuke when it's needed, but not to rebuke when it's not needed. To preach the whole counsel of God. To be focused on my listeners individually and what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Uh, so, when we're going to the open air, we shouldn't be focused on how big our crowd is. I mean... Obviously, if you're doing these things biblical, you're preaching the whole counsel of God with a heart of love towards sinners and a heart of wanting to glorify God, <clears throat> then it's great to have a big crowd. <clears throat> but if you're not doing those things, you're, rather, you're better off not having a crowd at all because you're making it worse on yourself. So having a big crowd is a means to an end, preaching the truth to as many people as possible, not the end in itself. And many open-air preachers seem to make, they have this idolatry of the big crowd 
and they, they want to have an open crowd and do whatever it takes to get an open crowd, and they can't get an open crowd, they'll maybe tell some stories that are, in my opinion, are ungodly to draw a big crowd or to keep the big crowd. Forget the crowd. Preach the whole counsel of God with a heart of love towards sinners and want to glorify God. And if God wants you to have a crowd, it'll come. If not, then so be it. You've, you've done your part. You can't make people listen. You can't make them come. You can't make them repent. And God won't make them come, and he won't make them repent. So uh, I, I do pray that God will draw sinners in while I'm preaching, uh, but not so I can say, look, i got a big crowd, and I can take some pictures and, and upload it, and look how big the crowd is I got. You know, you need to check your intentions and your motives concerning these issues to see if you're right before God. So that's, that's, that's uh, pitfall number five. And so far, we've looked at pitfall number one, staying in rebuke mood all the time. Pitfall number two, not preaching the whole counsel of God, or not having enough knowledge of the Bible, or not having enough, memory, uh, me enough verses memorized. Uh, number th pitfall number three, being hard-hearted towards the sinner, forgetting where we have come from, being violent towards the sinner. Number four, using words like whores, fags, and homos, etc. in the open air. Number five, the idolatry of drawing a crowd. And number six, the circus sideshow mentality. You know, this, there's been open-air preachers I've observed in the past, and uh, thank God there aren't many of these that I've seen, but it seems like their open-air preaching meeting is more of a circuit sideshow. It's more about fun and games than it is about being sober-minded when it comes to these issues we're preaching. Uh, when your open-air open meeting turns into jokes, fun, games, or something you get your jollies off of, yes, I heard it when the open-air preacher said that he got his jollies off of it, then there's something wrong with you. Uh, when the sinners come to hear you preach just to laugh and can't wait till you come back so they can laugh some more, then there's probably something wrong. We are talking about Christ and Him crucified. We're talking about the offer of forgiveness, mercy, and grace. We're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about judgment day and where the sinners might go. What is so funny about those things? There's nothing funny about those things if you ask me. Uh, so if your if you're open-air preaching is just like a circuit sideshow, then you have issues. You need to check yourself and uh, check what you're saying and what you're doing in the open air. You are not a stand-up comedian. You are a preacher who's supposed to preach the Bible. You are an ambassador of Christ, an ambassador of Christ. Act like it. Act like it. That's the way an open air meeting should be. Now, of course, you can't control what the sinners do. It, I mean, you can be completely blameless before God and they can turn it, they can want to turn it into a sideshow and and come around and mock you and dance around you and ride circles around you on your bike, whatever it may be. You can't control everything. But I'm talking about your part, preacher. Are, is what you're doing turning into a circus sideshow? Are you being blameless when it comes to this issue? You need to be. So that's, that's point number six, the circus sideshow mentality. Number seven, the dirty old man syndrome. If people walk away from your open-air preaching meeting, and feel like they've just been to a peep show, like they've been watching porn on the internet, then there's something wrong with your preaching. I'm all for rebuking sexual sin, and for telling people who are involved in sexual sin that they're going to hell and you repent, and forsake that sin and trust in Christ and follow Him. I wonder, though, if some open-air preachers have a line they draw as to what they will and won't talk about, because it doesn't seem like it to me. I've heard open-air preachers talk about things that I would never even think about let alone talk about. Uh, that some ungodly people won't even talk about, but they will talk about. And in the midst of being around sinners constantly and hearing their garbage come out of their, their mouth, we must make sure that we uh, come back to the throne of grace and ask God to cleanse our ears and cleanse our hearts and our minds, that we won't be tempted to give in to the things they're saying or become like them. No matter how filthy or wicked they get, in the open air, we shouldn't stoop down to their level and talk about the things that they want to talk about. Otherwise, we're being sinful just like them. And uh, I, I think my principle is we need to give room for the Holy Spirit to work in regards to these issues, and that uh, I don't need to rebuke every single little thing that the sinner, the filthy things that sinners do in secret. I don't need to mention each one by name or talk about it in explicit detail. And that's, that's nonsense. I'm going to give room for the Holy Spirit to work. And I'm not going to, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't even feel a couple talking about these things now. I won't even mention them on camera because it just disgusts me to hear 
anyone talk about it, let alone a person who claims to be representing Christ in the midst of sinners and preaching his gospel. So we need to be careful what comes out of our mouth. We need to keep a tight ring on our tongue, lest our religion become worthless, according to James chapter 1. Our tongue has the power of life and death. And uh, we shouldn't be shocking just to get our eyes out of sinners. We shouldn't be glorying in, glorying in our past sinful activities. We've all done wicked things in the past, things that I'm ashamed of and I, I feel I felt guilt over. But I, I'm not going to talk about those things in explicit detail to the point where sinners are going to get excited about me telling the story or they can't wait to hear the story that I tell on each campus. And, and uh, you know, and it, maybe it's going to give them ideas about what to do in their sinful life or it's going to make them think about sinful things. You know, I'm, I, if they should feel shame and guilt over these sinful things that they're doing, why should we glory in them and tell exciting stories about our past sinful activities? Is this really what Jesus Christ would have us do in the open air? I don't think so. I don't think you can find any justification in the Bible for doing such things. Uh, so if, if we feel shame and guilt about the way we sinned in the past, then we should bring shame and guilt to them. Not joke around about our past sinful activities in explicit detail, or glory in them to the point where sinners can't wait to to we tell this, this story to them. They've heard, they've seen on the internet. They've heard other people, you know, talk about it from other colleges or whatever it may be. That's not godly. So if if, if people are walking away from your open air meeting with this kind of sense, where you're a dirty old man, that dirty old man syndrome that you may have, then there's something wrong. Uh, you need to repent. And let your mouth be full of grace seasoned with salt, as the Bible says. So that's point number seven, the dirty old man syndrome. Number eight, staying in apologetics mode. Well, there are questions to be answered. And oftentimes, the questions are legitimate, and they're coming from sincere seekers of the truth. And not only that, oftentimes, uh, answering these mental intellectual objections will be a pathway to finally get to the sinner's heart. But we must keep the main thing the main thing. That's preaching the cross, preaching on sin, righteousness, and judgment, preaching on heaven and hell, preaching on grace and mercy and forgiveness offered to the sinner, preaching on eternal life, eternity. Those are the things we should be focused on more than anything else. And there will be times when you have to deal with these apologetical answers, or these questions that people are asking you, and they're legitimate, uh, even if the person asking the question it doesn't have a, they're kind of a mocker, they don't have a legitimate question, maybe someone else in the crowd who's listening has the same question and it is legitimate from their point of view, but they're too scared to ask the question. So there are times you must uh, detour and, and deal with these issues, but we must always bring the focus back to the center and come from the apologetics back to the cross, come from the apologetics back to sin, righteousness, and judgment, come from the apologetics back to where do you stand before God as a sinner. That's what we most always bring it back to, and keep the main thing the main thing. Uh, so we must keep on track uh, in the midst of our apologetic defense of the truth. So that's that's number eight. So so far we've gone through eight of them. Uh, point number one was staying in rebuke mode all the time. Point number two is not preaching the whole counsel of God, not having enough knowledge of the Bible, or not having enough of it memorized. Number three, being hard-hearted towards the sinner forgetting where we have come from and being violent towards a sinner. Number four, using words like whores, fags, and homos in the, in the open air. Number five, the idolatry of drawing the crowd. Number six, the circus sideshow mentality. Number seven, dirty old man syndrome. And number eight, staying in apologetics mode. And number nine, <clears throat> becoming a free speech activist. You know, many open air preachers who start out on the road properly, they get distracted by this issue where they, they think that they're actually a free speech activist, that they, they get so wrapped up in their rights being infringed upon, their, rights, their constitutional rights being taken away, their freedom of religion, their freedom of speech, by college campuses, by local police, uh, by whoever, and they get so involved in these things and pursuing lawsuits and correcting the local police stations, uh, educating about the Constitution, they get so involved in these things that they lose track of what their, their main purpose is to preach the gospel. You know, so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with filing lawsuits against a government that isn't obeying its own laws, 
or that it's wrong to stand up for your rights, <clears throat> but we shouldn't be so consumed with these issues that we get detoured and distracted from our main purpose, which is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, preaching Christ and Him crucified for admission of sins. And we definitely shouldn't get distracted to the point where we are acting ungodly towards the authorities or officials. Remember, they need Jesus too. And we don't wage war against flesh and blood. So when we're dealing with these cops, they may be our enemies in the fleshly sense that they're infringing upon our rights. But remember, they need the gospel too. Most of them need, they're not Christians, most of them. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ too. So we shouldn't go get so distracted by these things and get in tunnel vision where we're just, you know, so focused on our freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and our First Amendment rights that we're not, we're, we're, not holding on to our first purpose in the first place. Our primary purpose is to preach the gospel. You know, so that's what we should be doing. And um, so we shouldn't get so distracted by these things that we, that we neglect our primary purpose, which is preaching the gospel. Do the apostles have freedom of religion and freedom of speech? No, I don't ever see them becoming free speech activists or <clears throat> becoming so involved in politics that they are trying to stand up for their rights. No, they, they took their hardship, they endured as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, and they continue to focus what they're supposed to be focused upon, preaching Christ and Him crucified for remission of sins. And I encourage you to do the same thing. Don't get distracted by this. It's, it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's a good thing, but, you know, I, I think it's Leonard Ravenhood once said, the worst enemy of the best is the good. And the best is preaching Christ and Him crucified. And the good, standing up for your rights, you know, <clears throat> making sure you're not infringed upon, you can continue to have the free religion and freedom of speech, and that people who come behind you can continue to have these freedoms. That's a good thing, but it's not the best thing. And we can't get distracted by that. So that's number nine. Number ten, <clears throat> the final one is neglecting family <clears throat> to do ministry. Preachers, your family is your first ministry. If you are neglecting spending time with, ministering to, raising, training the Word of God, your family, uh, then you're not really doing ministry. I mean, what is what is the world going to think? Or the church? Or God? What, what is He going to think when you're out doing ministry and preaching, but your household is falling apart? What do you think God thinks about that? What do you think the church thinks about or the world thinks about that? I mean, open-air preaching is, is a very rare thing, although it is growing. But if, if you're a part of a local church and they're kind of maybe ostracizing you a little bit because you're involved in open-air preaching, what kind of witness do you think it is to them where you're going out open-air preaching but your family is falling apart because of your lack of a time and attention with them and training them in the Word of God and teaching them what the Bible says and leading them in these things? So we must be blameless before the world, before the church, and before God regarding this issue. Are you providing for your family financially? <laughs> Are you uh, ministering to your wife and children? Uh, how are your wife and children doing spiritually? Now, these are questions you must ask yourself. What kind of example are you setting? If you are doing what Christians are supposed to do biblically when it comes to evangelism, what kind of example are you setting in this other area of your life, raising your family, to people who aren't involved in evangelism? And if, if it's getting to the point where you're out there every single day and you're always away from your family traveling and your family never sees you, you're neglecting them, you're not there to help raise your family like you're supposed to be, then there's something wrong. Uh, if you're always away from home on, on preaching trips and you're not... Uh, taking the right time with your family and training them raising like you should, there's something wrong. So you need to check yourself. So let me go through the ten points again. Number one, staying in rebuke mode all the time. Number two, not preaching the whole counsel of God, not having enough of the Bible memorized, or not having enough knowledge of the Bible. Number three, being hard-hearted towards a sinner, forgetting where we have come from and being violent towards a sinner. Number four, using words like whores, fags, homos, etc. in the open air, unnecessary offense. Number five, the idolatry of drawing a crowd. Number six, the circus sideshow mentality. Number seven, dirty old man syndrome. Number eight, staying in apologetics mode. 
Number nine, becoming a free speech activist. Number ten, neglecting your family to do ministry. And in my opinion, all of these pitfalls of the open-air preacher are a symptom of one great problem. Not spending enough time in word, in the word of God, and in prayer. In Galatians 5.16 says, that If we walk according to the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the one <clears throat> problem the people who fall into this are involved in is they're not spending enough time in prayer with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not spending enough time in the Word. And these are symptoms of this one great problem. And there's one solution to all these problems that if, if you're involved in these things. One, repent of it, first of all. And number two, get in the Word daily, multiple times daily, and immerse yourself in the Word of God. Hide it in your heart that you will not sin against Him. Um, you know, man cannot live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Uh, you know, meditate upon this law day and night. They may be careful to all the things written in it, Joshua 1 8. So, this is what you should be doing and staying in prayer. You know, if you abide in Christ, you will not sin. If you abide in Christ, uh, you'll produce much fruit to His glory. And if you stay close to Him and follow Him as you should, He will never lead you into these pitfalls of the open air preacher. Never. He will always lead you on the narrow path in the way of righteousness and holiness. So if we abide in Christ, we produce much fruit for His glory. If we stay close to Him and follow Him, He will not lead us astray. Well, friends, hopefully <clears throat> this video has been edifying for you. If you are an open-air preacher right now, whether a new or a veteran, and you're involved in these things, I would encourage you to get right with God, repent of these things, uh, and start to do the necessary things to make sure you don't do these things again. Stay in the Word and stay in prayer. And if you're a potential open-air preacher, and you see people around you who are open-air preaching who are kind of like examples to you, and they're involved in these things, I would encourage you to gently correct them and to, if they don't change, to depart from fellowship with them in regards to open-air preaching and uh, do it the right way. Do it the right way. There are good examples out there concerning this issue, these issues. So, I pray this video has blessed you and edified you, and uh, I look forward to any comments or questions you may have. God bless.